Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new Ace in the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode I shall be reviewing the IAR-81C, a Romanian fighter aircraft that's found its way into the Italian tech tree as a premium aircraft coming at a tier of 2 and a battery rating of 2.7. For today's historical overview I'll be covering the IAR-81C from its inception as the IAR-80 through to the particular sub variant. With that, let's begin. In 1930, the Royal Romanian Air Force issued a specification for a new fighter aircraft. Whilst it was expected that a number of foreign companies would bid for the tender, unexpectedly, Industria Aeronautica Romana (IAR) put forward their own designs as well. No other Romanian company put forward a design. Whilst the Polish company PZL eventually won the contract with their PE-11 monoplane design. This was to only encourage IAR to compete in future bids. PZL were to win the next contract in 1936 with their P-24 design, beating the IAR-24 design. However, after each setback, IAR took on licensed production of the winning PZL design so they could improve their own design based on PZL's world-class designs at the time. For example, from the P-24, IAR took inspiration from the plane's tail section and front-end fuselage. Moreover, IAR was kept in business for its licensed production of the PZL aircraft that had won the contracts, and in 1938 this approach was to come to fruition, with the first prototype of their IAR-80 design. Powered by a licensed-built copy of the French Gnome Rhone 14K2 Mistral Major 870 horsepower air-cooled radial engine, known as the IAR K14-3 C32, the prototype proved to be 50 miles per hour or 80 kilometers an hour faster than the contemporary PZL P24E design at 4,500 meters altitude, or 14,764 feet, with a top speed of 370 miles per hour, or 510 kilometers an hour, when it flew for the first time in April of 1939. Further test flights showed the plane was rather maneuverable, and also allowed IAR to identify issues which were fixed during the rest of the year. Changes were also made to the design in this time, including the installation of the more powerful IAR K14-3 C36 930 horsepower radial engine and the expansion of the fuel tanks located between the engine and the cockpit to allow the plane to carry 455 litres of fuel. These changes led to a production order for 100 aircraft being placed on the 18th of December 1939. The plane's initial armament was two wing-mounted Belgian-made 7.92mm Fabrique Nationale or FN Browning machine guns. This being expanded to six machine guns as of the first 20 production models when they started to roll off the assembly line in January of 1941. This delay being due to the fall of Belgium in May of 1940, which was to be overcome when Romania joined the Axis in November of 1940. The planes equipped with six machine guns were designated as IAR 80As, and following combat service against the Soviet Union from June 1941 onwards, it was decided in 1942 to swap the machine guns for 13.2mm FN machine guns, these planes being delivered between June and September of 1942 and designated as the IAR-80B sub-variant. In parallel to the IAR-80's development, the Royal Romanian Air Force also had a need to replace its dive bomber aircraft as of 1941. Initially attempts were made to purchase German JU-87B Stukas, but these attempts were unsuccessful. Instead, IAR was tasked with converting the IAR-80A design into a dive bomber which would be known as the IAR-81. This conversion saw a hinge bomb cradle placed under the plane's central fuselage to drop a 500-pound or 227-kg bomb. The bomb cradle arrangement ended up hampering the plane's overall performance, and when the plane entered combat service as of late 1941, proved severely unpopular with its pilots. The IAR-81A followed in the summer of 1942, whereby unlike the IAR-80B, the plane's armament was uprated to 13.2mm FM machine guns. However, with the arrival of United States B-24s over Romanian skies at this time, the IAR-81A was soon returned to being used as a fighter. Yet, with supplies to 13.2mm machine gun limited, the Royal Romanian Air Force signed a deal with the German company Icaria for a supply of 20mm MG FFM cannon. To accommodate the cannon, the plane's wing had to be redesigned, which led to delays in the plane entering production. When it did in late 1942, its originally intended designation of the IAR-81B dive bomber was scrapped for the IAR-80C fighter, with 60 of these fighters being delivered between December of 1942 and April 1943. From the 10th aircraft onwards, the plane featured self-sealing fuel tanks. 
As for the IAR81C, the plane you're seeing on screen today, it was the culmination of the IAR80's development path as a fighter, seeing the 20mm MG FF cannon swapped for two 20mm Mauser MG151 cannon to accommodate two 7.92mm FM machine guns in the wings. An order for 100 aircraft, powered by the IAR K14 1000A 1025 horsepower radio engine, was placed in May of 1942, with additional orders placed in February of 1943 and January of 1944, so that the plane could act as a stopgap until the Messerschmitt Bf109G into production in IAR's factories. The plane was withdrawn from combat service in July of 1944, when the Bf109G6 was available in sufficient numbers. Please note I have not been able to find any record of the IAR-81C being used in Italian service. Therefore, with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the IAR-81C handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the frontline map African Canyon. For this we'll be using the following setup. Stealth belts for our machine guns, the reasoning being twofold. Firstly, in my experience, the stealth belts are proven to be the most powerful out of those available, but more importantly, the lack of tracer attributed to these belts allows us to focus on the tracer equipped belts for our 20mm cannon, that is the air target belts, which in my experience are the most powerful, simply because of the large concentration of high explosive incendiary mining gashosh shells, which will cause anything in the sky to fall apart upon successful impact. Our gun convergence is set to 400m, noting that it affects all of our armament as it's all wing mounted and this setting is because we'll typically try to engage our foes at closer ranges, but as we're going to go on to sea in the midst of a turn fight, the slow nature of this aircraft can cause our foes to drift quite a distance away before we get the chance to open fire, meaning that a gun convergence of say 250 meters may be less advised. As for our fuel load, we are taking the standard 30 minute fuel load to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscaled on fuel capacity. We begin our analysis then by noting that the climb rate of the IAR-81C is rather interesting, because when you look at it initially you'll find that the climb rate of this plane is rather poor, and if anything the vast majority of its opponents as dedicated fighters and even a good number of heavy fighters will be able to outclimb this plane in short bursts of 1000 to 1500 meters altitude, and particularly when this plane is at the lower end of the battle rated spectrum in a 3.7 game, going up against the likes of the Spitfire Mark 5B drops and the Messerschmitt 109F4s you're really going to feel the pain in terms of climb rate. But it has one hit of a feature and that is incredible low speed stability which you're seeing on screen right now. In the fact you can replicate the effects of say the A6M2N, the Japanese hydroplane fighter at the same battle rating, with you available in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now, by being able to sustain your climb below 240km an hour rather well at a 25 degree angle of climb, balancing it over more emergency power. And that means you can very gradually creep to altitudes in excess of 4,000 meters, whereas a good number of your foes will not have that sustainability over the long period. Therefore, whilst you're not going to be the first to get to an excess of 4,000 or 5,000 meters altitude, falling behind the likes of, say, the A36 Apache and the Spitfire Mark IIa, you'll get there eventually, and when given the space to do so, you can go bomber hunting. And that is something this plane does extremely well, because if you're allowed to get onto the warpath of an enemy bomber, and I'll explain what I mean by that shortly, what you'll be able to do is use your 20mm cannon to great effect, and we're about to set up a very nice double kill against the Wellington and the G4M1, where the Wellington is pulling us onto their ally. We do critical damage to the rear section of their plane, and then we go for the G4M1, cutting them apart for our first kill before coming around to finish it off the spinning Wellington out of the sky, picking up our double strike. Now we saw there how quickly the 20mm cannon went through the bombers. We have to keep in mind of course that the damage models of the bombers have been changed as of update 1.79, but the two 20mm cannon are a real nice effect on the enemy bombers durability. With that we can see a Messerschmitt 110 coming in, but they're going for our ally in the Messerschmitt 110. And it is worth noting throughout this game, the reason I'm not being contested so much is because I'm playing behind the safety net of my allies whilst doing this guy in front of me. And this is important in the fact that the IAR-81C is not going to be the frontline plane initially. You need to give it time and space to get into a position in order to be able to assert dominance. Now in other games where you'll be confronted, where you'll be the frontline plane, that's where the difficulty comes in. And we'll see later on how when we are confronted, we have to try and turn the tables to our advantage. But when given the space to operate, we can act as a bomber hunter, albeit a rather slow one. And this is where one of the major downsides of the plane comes in immediately, and that is its lack of speed. It's first worth noting that the straight line acceleration is playing from its stall speed, which is rather high, at 145 km an hour, all the way up to 340 km an hour on engine power alone is rather lethargic. 
You could use War Emergency Power to overcome this somewhat, getting you up to 400 km an hour, but it's not great. I mean, this planet is going to struggle to chase down a good number of foes, whether it be in level flight or in a dive. Because the problem only continues in a dive, whereby your dive speed acceleration is rather slow, and especially beyond the point of 750 km an hour, even at 90 degrees in a dive. Your maximum dive speed is 840 km an hour, which is not too bad at a battery rate of 2.7, but you will see a good number of planes that will at least out accelerate you, if not outrun you completely in the dive in the long haul. And that's where the picture of this plane being poor for boom and zoom really starts to come in, because it lacks the ability to build up enough speed to go into the highest speed strike, whether it be in level flight converted into a dive, or starting off at low speed and going into an immediate dive. And then this carries through in terms of energy retention, as we'll go into in a bit. But for now, note how we use a gradual dive here to close the distance on the enemy B-25, and they're given ample time to react to our position in the sky, simply because we're coming over at such a slow rate, maintaining approximately 495 km an hour right now and decreasing. And that's another thing to note when we come on to energy retention, the straight line speed retention of this plane is absolutely abysmal, whereby when you come out of a dive at extreme speeds, you'll find that you'll lose the vast majority of your speed until you hit 460 km an hour, and then this plane starts to hold on to its speed decently. But until that point you will lose all your speed and it means outrunning foes who are pursuing you in a dive is a real problem. And again chasing after bombers can be difficult simply because they'll be able to retain their speed in a straight line just as well if not better than you in the long haul. And the B-25 is notorious for that if it goes into an extreme angle dive. Fortunately our opponent did not and they tried to hold on to their position using their defensive armament and some slightly evasive manoeuvres. Our 21 meter cannon said otherwise. Now as we go for another reload. One other thing to note about the armament is you have ample ammunition. 350 rounds in total for cannon, or 175 per cannon means that you're not going to need reloads immediately. You can take down a large number of foes before you need to go for a reload. And it's the same with the machine guns, with 700 rounds per machine gun. And as we now start to make our way towards enemy territory and hold over the enemy's position as they climb up out of spawn, we can start to play around with those trying to contest us, and we can see how the IR-81C refers to turn fight rather than attacking a boom and zoom or playing the vertical. And this is where we start to come onto the concept of energy retention and maneuverability. Now I've already talked around straight line energy retention, i.e. speed retention. What about in the vertical? Well interestingly, in boom and zoom you can conduct short distance boom and zoom rather successfully, in that if you go from an altitude of say 4000 meters, conduct a 1250 meter dive at 90 degrees, and then climb back up at a return angle of 30 degrees, you'll be able to rebuild your position in the sky by get back to 4000 meters altitude, and get back there with the same speed you started off at, as we cut over the top of the P400, breaking away just in case we collided into them, and you can see the maneuverability of the plane here in great effect. However, longer distance boom and zoom is not going to work to your advantage, and you have stronger energy retention in the horizontal, albeit do not let your foes push you into a vertical spiral or sack, as if you end up in that position, as we saw there going after the P400, that's where you really start to bleed your energy, going back into the vertical. So instead, keep things in the horizontal, and it's going to work in your favour. Now the Heinkel 112 coming up towards us, we may conduct another boom and zoom strike if we feel it's favourable, and we're about to do so. But note here I have to think about my actions, starting with the Spitfire who's turned at the last minute, we're able to take them out for another kill, and then swing around on the Heinkel 112. Because the issue with this is, now that I've come down and dropped a considerable amount of altitude, and bled a considerable amount of speed in making my manoeuvres on those two foes, I will now not have the speed to return to my starting perch, I will sacrifice a key amount of speed, which means I am exposed to planes climbing up after me, and those flying off into the distance to come at me from high altitude and from a far away position, such as the enemy Hellcat. And that is going to iterate exactly how the poor energy retention of this plane in the vertical will hold it back over time. You cannot conduct successive boom and zoom dives on foes without being punished in your energy retention and therefore your safety over the enemy team. So instead you will need to start with drawing out to far distance, build up your altitude, build up your speed once again before going back in for those strike positions. But as we make our way away, let's talk about manoeuvrability. And we've seen so far this plane is rather manoeuvrable. Now it's ideal speed range of what is 325 to 450 km an hour, what you'll find is that this plane has a rather strong turn circle. Not to the level of a Spitfire Mark IIa, just slightly behind that, however the turn circle is very comparable to the likes of the P40C and P40E Kitty Hawks, whereby what you'll be able to do in the plane is essentially turn on par with them, or I should say the P40C Warhawk, and the net result of this is you have a capable plane at your hands because you have to add into the fact that your roll rate is great for your batter rating and your rudder is rather strong, allowing you to conduct some rather tight flat rudder turns and really help out when you need to conduct a hammerhead or tighten your turn in general. 
The only downside to your maneuverability is the elevator control surface, which is lackluster compared to the other two control surface domains. And what you'll find is, whilst your positive G response is okay, it's slow initially, your negative G response is really poor. And when you go for a negative G response, it'll cause your plane to wobble significantly and take time to recover from the initial control input. So you need to avoid fighting in the negative G where possible and stay in a positive G control situation. As you go to higher and higher speeds, as we'll come on to shortly, the control surfaces become more limited and that's where the boom and zoom nature of this plane starts to fade away immediately. But now we've got to deal with an F6X Hellcat coming in on R6 and what we decide to do is cut underneath them via a split S, only using the negative G control on our elevator for a brief period just to completely shake up the situation and get into the split S. And here we force the Hellcat to overshoot because they carry too much speed and then we get onto their six and we start to cut into them. But note how we're bleeding a lot of energy already in the vertical and that means if the Hellcat is able to survive our onslaught they will get away to live to fight another day. But we take them out of our 20mm cannon and we're able to pick up that kill as a result. And that's where the contrast of the performance of this plane comes in. Because in the horizontal your energy retention is okay, albeit successive manoeuvres will bleed a good amount of energy, but you'll be able to hold on for some time, just keep in mind you should not let your speed drop below 275km an hour, otherwise you start to experience a lack of stability whenever you try to put an input into the elevator control surface, and the elevator also starts to become heavier below 250km an hour. But you want to keep your flights in the horizontal rather than in the vertical, and it will work well and you can force your opponents to overshoot for your roll rate and the maneuverability on your rudder and your roll rate in particular. Now what about high speed controllability? We started talking about that. Well, interestingly at high speed, this plane becomes difficult to manage, but not to an extreme extent, but you will feel the effects. In that with your roll rate between 525 and 750 km an hour, you will lose 50% of your roll rate. Now this alone is not too bad, you can compensate for this if you need to conduct boom and zoom passes or go for a high speed interception or a bomber that's diving away. It's when you move into the rudder domain that the issues come in. Between 550 and 650 km an hour, you will find that you lose 50% of your rudder's controllability, meaning your ability to be precise in aiming this plane in a high speed dive completely diminishes and therefore it's hard to get a shot on target. And as for your elevator, between 600 and 750 km an hour, you will lose 10% of your elevator's performance, which is not too noticeable, really only ends up doing what's already a problem on the elevator in terms of the initial response, in that it slows the initial response by 10%, but beyond that, your looping circle, and on top of that, the net overall elevator response remains the same, as we pick off the Heinkel 111 there for another kill. But in general, with these three aspects combined, this goes to show how the plane's not well suited for boom and zoom. And when you consider the energy retention, whether it be in a straight line or a vertical, it only encourages this fact even more. Now what about durability? Because sometimes, unlike what you're seeing here when you go after an enemy bomber or an enemy fighter, you'll find you're going to take it. Well, I'm pleased to note that the airframe of this plane is rather strong, in that it can take a good amount of machine gun fire before it falls apart, and on top of that it can take successive 20mm cannon shells before it comes apart. You do need to keep in mind the exposed nature of your engine in the head-on, in the fact it's rather glaring, it's rather large, and therefore it can get hit and damaged, but it's not going to get knocked out instantly, and this plane has a rather low chance of bursting into flames, keep in mind the fuel tanks are all located between the engine and the cockpit, they're not located in the wings, so wing strikes are not going to cause you to burst into flames, unlike a good number of aircraft at your battery rating, such as the Cow S61s from what I recall. But the game coming to an end, it's time for us to take a look at the boat game stats. With our 12 kills, we're able to pick up 65,695 silver lines and 7,759 research points. To defeat the IAR 81C in a given matchup, then, I can recommend one or two approaches. The first is to lure it into a turn fight, particularly below 2,000 meters altitude, at which point the engine performance of this plane will be severely compromised in terms of straight line acceleration and also climb rate. These effects, combined with the poor vertical energy retention of the plane, means that this plane is ideal for baiting into a vertical spiral, at which point planes with wider turn circles, or equal, wider being the MiG-334 for example, and equal being the MS-410, these planes will have the ability to cause the IR 81 c pilot to stall out, at which point their mediocre stall recovery, having to get to 200 km an hour before they'll regain control of the plane, means they're exposed to you hammerheading around and knocking them out of the sky. And if you have the superior turn circle from the outset in a plane such as the A6M2N, then you're going to have a field day in such a situation. Option number two is to simply outclimb this plane from the outset, 
As mentioned at the start of this review, this plane has a rather poor climb rate, which is highly sustainable but takes considerable time to get this plane up to 4000 meters altitude plus. Therefore planes such as the Spitfire Mark IIa, the Messerschmitt 109 ML3, the A36 and the C202EC will all get above this plane and be able to strike it down hard via a series of boom and zoom strikes. Keep in mind the lack of speed in this aircraft also means that if you happen to miss and need to fly away in a straight line, the AR is not going to catch up to you anytime soon. Particularly as you go above 4,500 meters altitude, at which point your speed advantage will become noticeable. And do keep in mind the maximum altitude limit on the engine performance of this plane is 5,000 meters altitude, and for control surfaces it's 5,250 meters altitude. Which exposes this plane to a rather weird ideal altitude range of 2,500 to 4,000 meters altitude i.e. above this altitude range it will be exposed to the superior performance of its battery rating contemporaries and below this altitude range it will be exposed to its weaknesses in the turn fire and overall engine performance at such low altitude. But by avoiding such circumstances in our own IAR 81C today, hopefully we demonstrate that this rather slow fighter is nonetheless rather punishing if given the opportunity to get close enough to its foes. We are very fortunate to be able to intercept a number of bombers on their flight path to the target rather than having to pursue, and in the cases where we did pursue, we had to be relentless and chase them down over time, and make sure to be given ample space to do so. And that's one thing I must clarify, that if you are confronted early on in a given match, you're going to have a much more difficult time, and you have to try and force your opponents to overshoot you when they strike you from above, such as against the enemy Hellcat. And you can use your maneuverability in this plane, which is rather uncanny, in order to do so. But otherwise you'll need to put in a lot of effort to get the most out of this aircraft but when you do it can feel very rewarding knowing that rather powerful firepower is available at your fingertips with a 220mm cannon in the wings. Therefore if I had to conclude I'd have to say that the IR-81C is one of those fighters which should not be underestimated as whilst it may be slow it is a slow and present danger to everyone. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies.